So I thought that um, today I would look at the topic of witnessing, um, peace of mind, and non-doership um, in a way that um, might demonstrate some things that um, may not be obvious to us and may sort of um, uh, lead to a certain type of seeking that actually is maintaining the same um, misunderstanding that is at the very root of um, the suffering that eventually can end. But that suffering won't end if, in fact, we are maintaining the same principle within the seeking. So um, if that is happening, if the seeking is somehow reinforcing the very principle that is at the root of the suffering, then it's important for us to see that. Because if we don't, then we might think that we're seeking in a way that is beneficial, seeking in a way that we are waiting for it to have an effect. And what it might be doing is reinforcing the very root of that which in the situation where the seeking um, comes to fruition is the dissolving of that um, principle or that root. So if we are bringing that same principle into the seeking, we need to, um, need to recognize that. And the principle that is at the root of the suffering um, is the principle of doership and attachment to outcome. That's just a concept. Um, that is the conceptual description. So if someone says, okay, so what is at the root of the suffering when suffering arises? Um, let's say suffering in its primary form, in a, in a form where um, we feel anxiety or we feel despair, we feel um, a lack of self-worth or abandonment, we feel alone. It's a feeling that in this teaching is described as an uncomfortableness with oneself. And that uncomfortableness with oneself sort of colors the whole experience of life, or at least life in that moment, where the experience doesn't feel particularly acceptable. The uncomfortableness with oneself forces a resistance to that um, Mm. that experience of life and that resistance is is a sense that this is not acceptable and so where does that come from and in theory the, or the theoretical answer the conceptual answer well, so there's a bit of a difference the the conceptual answer is is an answer that puts a, an explanation on something. So that's the conceptual answer. And in theory, the root is a deep, the ingrained belief of doership and attachment to outcome, which we can call um, a psychological sense of self. And in practice, the expression of that theoretical root is the uncomfortableness. So the theoretical root of doership and attachment to outcome expresses itself as a sense of uncomfortableness in life. And when the description is put forward that liberation is the end of suffering, Liberation is peace of mind. And continuous peace of mind in daily living, which really means being in the world, functioning as a human being, and finding that this uncomfortableness is, is absent. That is described as happiness for the human being. That is the form in which happiness for the human being is available. And when that is how life is experienced, i.e. ordinary, everyday, daily living, but without the uncomfortableness. If someone says, you know, are you, are you happy? 
the answer is, oh, yes, I'm happy. Um, and they say, what is it that makes you happy? And I say, well, it's not so much something that makes me happy, but it's the absence of what I would call unhappiness, the absence of what was previously here. And that which was previously here, I would say, is my unhappiness. And when the unhappiness dissolves, there is a recognition, oh, yes, of course, this is the happiness that is available for the human being, not um, the happiness that I imagined when that uncomfortableness was there. When the uncomfortableness was there, the uncomfortableness was telling us that, you know, happiness will be found in a new relationship, in a new job, in better living situations. And so there is a seeking for that. Um, and essentially that means the misunderstanding that my happiness is available in the form of new circumstance. And in fact, we find when it sets in that there is this um, undeniable appreciation that of course it fe we, we feel it. Oh yes, this is the happiness that is available for the human. And we'll say, and it's nothing like what I thought. It is simply the absence of uncomfortableness. And if the uncomfortableness is there, the seeking for new circumstance, for better this, better that, um, doesn't have a, there's no reason for that to be there. And so that's when it becomes apparent that the seeking for circumstance is not the answer, but really just a byproduct, an assumption of um, what's missing. And really, it's a misunderstanding, it's a, it's a conclusion that has unfortunately got it wrong, and it's a conclusion that stems out of the uncomfortableness. So when the uncomfortableness not, not, falls away, we realize, oh, I'm not looking for anything different. Someone said, what would you like different in your life if you have one of these days of comfortableness? And you say, well, actually, I know life is always going to change. Sometimes it's going to change for the better in terms of pleasure in the moment, and sometimes it's going to be pain in the moment. But, you know, I'll have to leave that to life. To be honest, I, am, I, I can't tell you what I um, want what I need to be different. There, there isn't some, I'm comfortable in this moment. And that's when it becomes clear. It was never about circumstance. And so in a way we need to start having these glimpses, these um, periods of comfortableness in life. And if I didn't mention this every day. Um, the probability is that we would have those periods of comfortableness and think nothing of them, pay no attention to them. And if that's the case, then in a way they're wasted. They're not in in the fact that they're there means that in that moment someone may not what isn't feeling uncomfortable isn't feeling unhappiness but the conscious recognition of that oh here it is the absence of suffering is unlikely to be there unless it's been particularly pointed at because it's so ordinary it doesn't jump out and say hey look what you have today it's sort of just the absence of something and so it's very easy to um, not be particularly grateful for something being missing. If the suffering is very intense and then there is a period, a day even, or an hour of no suffering, then it becomes noticed by the, by the person that has very intense suffering. It's like, ah, oh, what a relief. That heaviness, that contractedness, that uncomfortableness, feeling like things are going to go wrong, feeling that there's no hope, feeling that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy of this, um, blaming and resenting the other for what they've done, society for being the way they are, um, society for 
turning life into an exploitation of resources and whatever, whatever the intellect is coming up with, the thinking mind, if that drops, it's like, oh, what a relief. But if your life isn't um, filled with intense suffering, but rather it's a sort of a, a lighter version of suffering, in those periods when there is no suffering, the relief that you feel may not be that um, obvious a contrast. And it may be that we're still um, assuming that it's about something in the future, and so maybe there aren't actually these um, uh, moments, these periods of no suffering, because there, there could be a subtle suffering all the time um, in this automatic assumption that, oh, I need to get somewhere. So it is important for us to realize these periods of very plain, ordinary absence of suffering. Because recognizing that becomes part of the um, fuel that we need to deepen the understanding that that could be all that it is that is available in, this, in terms of what enlightenment is. A setting in of this simple absence of suffering on a continuous unbroken basis. Now, the doer and attachment principle won't find that particularly interesting. I mean, I've described this to um, uh, people before, especially those that aren't really on this particular path. They sort of think about it, um, imagine what I'm saying, and they say, well, that doesn't sound really... They, they actually say, I'm not sure that I want that. Um, especially if I have to give something up, because often um, the peace of mind is described as the falling away of certain movements, like um, maybe not being so interested in how life turns out, not being um, so much in opposition with how life is. And that can seem like a challenge to someone who is passionate about um, you know, resisting life, passionate about resisting um, various movements of various groups and saying, no, someone needs to do something about this. I say, well, you know, maybe that can happen without um, an insistence on an outcome, without what I'm describing as doership and attachment to outcome. And so then the peace of mind is described as a, a disinterest in the flow of life, which doesn't mean not participating in the flow of life. It doesn't mean not feeling pleasure or pain, but it means being attitudinally and psychologically detached. Now, when that's described to someone who isn't necessarily feeling it, the description sounds really quite unappealing. It's like, well, in a sense, it's like, who would I be if I'm not interested in that stuff? So this description of the very ordinary peace of mind as the absence of uh, suffering can sound very unappealing to the belief in doership and attachment to outcome. It hardly sounds like the holy grail um, of realizations. It hardly sounds like the, um, you know, the uh, heaven on earth. So we really start getting down to the crux of it as a seeker when we've had enough experience of life, of uncomfortableness, and the pointers, the descriptions, um, meet, we, we meet with the pointers at a place where we can go, yes, yes, I, I get a sense that that's what it's about. Because if we haven't essentially ripened enough, um, 
then it's just not going to sound appealing. Hmm. And if it doesn't sound appealing, if it isn't appealing, then no motivation to move down that in that direction is going to be there. So essentially what I've been highlighting here is that the the process is a process of the dissolving of a certain mm, content, a certain layer of content that pervades the present moment life experience. And that present moment life experience is always, you know, what's renewing itself. And if this layer of uncomfortableness is continually present in every new moment of life, then basically we, we can say, well, my experience of life Mm. is consistently uncomfortable or has regular insertions of this uncomfortableness. So um, the description is that the, the, the freedom is the freedom from that layer of uncomfortableness. Now, that's not something that we do. Um, it's not something that we can say, okay, so tell me about this. Tell me... Um, how to do it. And th that's the risk in putting forward all of these descriptions. Um, they can be, and they can very much sound like, okay, so this is what you must focus on. So if it's, this is what you must focus on, it says, well, you, it sounds like you as a separate doer must pay attention to these sort of things or these, these things. And if if a warning isn't put in to the teaching, then that movement can happen and it can feel like, oh, I, not the suffering, but I am observing the suffering when it arises and that's one of the things I need to um, become familiar with is the suffering. The suffering as described as guilt and blame and pride, etc., and I need to be able to start seeing it. Um, however, if that's done with the intellect, if there is someone looking to see the suffering and then a labeling of the suffering, um, it may be that that actually is not the pure working mind or not, or witnessing, not that witnessing and working on the same thing, but they're two different ways that the suffering can be um, seen without it being more suffering. If it's just the working mind or just witnessing, then that activity isn't suffering coming in the back door. But it's very possible that the observing can be a sneaking in of the from the back door of the belief in doership and attachment to outcome. And if that's happening, the feedback I would get is, look, I've been sort of engaged in the teaching for some time. I understand the concepts intellectually. Um, and yet I just don't feel I um, have an experience of non-doership, for example, or... Um, of witnessing happening. And that might be because the doer principle has taken up the seeking. So to avoid this from happening in perpetuity, it's good for me to mention um, some things that are not sort of descriptions of what to become aware of. Um, and that is that suffering in the moment 
is destiny unfolding. If it's there as part of the circumstance, then both the circumstance and the uncomfortable feeling, um, either an uncomfortable feeling because of a specific circumstance, that it's something not going correct, or just waking up, no particular circumstance but feeling uncomfortable. If that's there, that's destiny. That's life designed, created by source in this moment to be this way. And if a seeking movement comes in that says, okay, this is suffering and what I've heard is available is the end of suffering, is peace of mind. So that um, concept of peace of mind or the end of suffering, peace of mind being happiness for the human being, that concept can, without us really realizing it, turn into the basis for resistance um, with the suffering in the moment. Now, before any um, spiritual teachings, if suffering arose, there would be a resistance to the suffering because that's what... Um, suffering inspires it's an uncomfortableness and then we um, feel the uncomfortableness and we feel like i need to do something to fix this so there would be um, before any spiritual teachings there will be suffering and then an involvement in that suffering so the primary suffering and then secondary suffering which is another layer of suffering beyond the first the primary layer of suffering which is asking why is this here like this shouldn't be here um, what do I need to do to get rid of it? Is it because I don't have a purpose in life? How am I going to find out what my purpose in life is? I need to find a project that I can um, be passionate about. And uh, so that's the suffering and then an extra layer of trying to solve the suffering, which is more suffering. And that's just natural. That's um, a movement that happens because the primary suffering is an uncomfortableness with oneself. And so uncomfortableness with oneself basically means an unacceptable experience. And so there's an automatic movement to try and fix it. The fixing it um, is before spiritual um, teachings come in, it usually is... Um, something to do with um, concepts we understand before teachings introduce spiritual concepts and it's more usually about material and relationships and things like that um, so we come up with ideas that you know I need this project to get my, my teeth stuck into or I need to find a partner or whatever um, when spiritual teaching delivers um, comes in it, it might be that the additional suffering is inspired by the content of the spiritual teaching. And so an example I'm giving is that the very idea, the very notion, the concept that happiness is the end of suffering, peace of mind, might um, imply that I have to do peace of mind and I have to do the end of suffering. And so when the suffering arises, then an investigation into the suffering might happen um, with the intention, with the attachment to the suffering changing, with the intention and attachment to the uncomfortableness going away. Now that intention, that attachment, that... Um, engaging in the investigation as a sort of, if I do this, then I'll get that. Completely understandable, right? It makes sense that that's how life seems to work. But because we're um, applying the same attitude, the attitude that seems like how life works, that I am going to have to fix the experience of life and make it what I would like it to be, that very attitude is the attitude of personal doership and attachment to outcome. That is at the root of the primary suffering. And so when the primary suffering is there, someone might say, okay, so what do I have to do to bring about the end of suffering? And if that 
suffering is based in theory the base of that suffering is doership and attachment to outcome the deeply ingrained belief of doership and attachment to outcome and then on the outer level on the on the present day level on the um, conscious level let's say there is a seeing of that uncomfortableness that suffering and then saying okay so how do i fix it so now that same attachment to outcome that same I can make this different is kicking in. And instead of unraveling the root of the primary suffering, and as I've said, the root of the primary suffering conceptually is being described as a root of deeply ingrained doership and attachment, instead of unraveling that, if the same attitude is being um, fed into, meaning an involvement, in the primary suffering, it's doing the opposite of unraveling the root. It's essentially saying, I continue to believe in this moment that doership and attachment to outcome is the way to go, is who I am. So there needs to be a part of us that starts to be encouraged, strengthened, um, and actually the teaching is always doing this, but we might not hear it this way, but a part of us needs to be encouraged and strengthened to really understand that that's destiny in the moment. That when the suffering arises, there's nothing to do. Why is there nothing to do? Because that is how life, how God how source, consciousness, whatever word you want to use for that which is creating the experience. Um, and let's be clear, that is not you creating the experience. But whatever is creating the experience, including the feelings that um, are coming through the body-mind organism, that component of experience plus the entirety of the visual experience the time and space component of the experience the experience of the other people so there is your inner the inner world experience and the outer world experience and hopefully we can um, see that that in combination makes up the totality of our present moment experience and so in the moment when there are, there's the visuals of the of daily living, and the uncomfortableness, there are many. Those are se several different layers or components of the present moment experience, and that is the masterpiece that has been created in this moment. And you, not the me component, not the one suffering, because that's not who you are. Um, our true nature doesn't know how to suffer. Our true nature doesn't know how to think. Our true nature doesn't know how to speak. All of those things, the speaking, the thinking, the feelings, they are happenings that are um, impersonal and uncreated in the way we imagine things to be created. They just appear... And what I am, what you are, is that which is the audience to that which appears. So any thinking is not what you are. Any feeling, any uncomfortableness is not what you are. So if you see um, thinking happening and you go, well, I'm thinking and I'm trying to figure out what to do about um, this uncomfortableness, in fact, I'm um, registering it as blame, which means I see that it is blaming the other for what they did. Now, that seems like it's exactly what the teaching is saying. And so it, it, it can reinforce, it can allow this what is not you to carry on where there is an involvement and an identification with that thinking it is me because we think oh i am the one that is seeing the primary suffering and registering it as blame and that's all thought 
So be that which is aware of the circumstance, the trees, the, the bird, the dog, the cold if it's cold or the hot if it's hot, the wind, um, the suffering. So be that which is aware of all of these moving components. Understand you are not something that can think or speak. Be quiet. And so for those that have more intense suffering and um, are wondering, why don't I get it? What's, why, what am I missing? You know, I get it intellectually. Um, you see how, how easy it is for there to be a part of the experience that is resisting the uncomfortableness, saying, okay, but um, this is just too uncomfortable. And um, I'm, I, the, the, the seeker, the one that has listened to the teachings, is trying to address it with all the right thoughts, you know, the, um, all the concepts and saying, so I get it intellectually, I, I'm addressing it, but um, nothing significant seems to shift. And the reason is because what is addressing the suffering is an, another strand of the same suffering energy. And it's come up like it has in our whole life. And we know ourselves as what we think we are is actually the movement of doership and attachment to outcomes. And so a reason to be still needs to be um, injected into the system. Being still when the, the uncomfortableness is intense um, it can be extremely difficult, very counterintuitive. What it means is sit and allow the uncomfortableness. And for our whole life, as soon as uncomfortableness arises with a certain intensity, there is a movement of thought. Not only thought, you might, the body might actually get up and walk around because it has got a set of defense mechanisms that, that have been put in place as part of the um, working mind or thinking mind that has decided this is the best way to deal with uncomfortableness is to get involved in it. And um, maybe if we're not consciously getting involved in it, we feel uncomfortable and the body gets up and walks around, gets on social media, whatever, to distract itself. Because the truth is just sitting there can feel like we're going to die can feel like this is this being with this is not good this is bad news for me this is going to kill me if i stay with it long enough this um that's what the feeling will say you know, this is going to kill me so automatically intuitively we will move away from it and that moving away from it may well be involvement in the suffering which is more of the attitude of doership and attachment to outcome. To be silent means to be that which is not thinking, not the body, but that which is aware of the suffering in this moment, is, is recognizing, is the audience to it. And it doesn't seem like an answer at first. But I can assure you, and you need to see it for yourself, the other movement is not an answer either. That's what's been happening all the time as the solution to uncomfortableness. And then, um, so before we came across spiritual teachings, that was happening in a particular way. 
after the spiritual teachings come in, it may still happen in the same um, uh, way, those same defenses that go for food or go for sex or go for social media or um, trying to get appreciation and to feel good. Those might still kick in or a, a, a defense that employs the teaching that says, okay, I obviously haven't got this yet. Let me, let me get it. So a defense that uses the teaching as camouflage can kick in. Um, and I, I'm hoping to point out in this, see if that's happening and understand that the answer is, is not an answer of doing anything. It's an answer of becoming aware of that movement. Um, and that might happen in, in a sense where there is the uncomfortableness and you, um, it's not so much about when I say sit with it, it doesn't really mean sit down, but in a way it does because the body, if it's moving, will automatically move in a way that it understands will be a form of distraction. So if you find the body sitting down, that actually helps what we are, which is this formless, silent witness to be aware and then the as the uncomfortableness intensifies you might notice certain thoughts like the thought i don't know that this isn't working this isn't good that which is aware of that thinking is what you are aware of the primary suffering that's feeling very intense and the resistance the the, th the thinking mind firing into action, um, trying to convince the system to do anything than just be silent. And it might become apparent how that thinking which masquerades itself so well in a way that we can easily say, oh, this is me thinking about the uncomfortableness and how to fix it. That thinking might be seen as just thought, which is really still the suffering energy um, arising in, a, um, in a, new, a new direction. And that new direction is the suffering energy being involved in. So it's the attitude of doership and attachment. In this um, sense, attachment means the resisting, the pushing away, the aversion of. Um, so it's the same suffering energy that's split and is now commenting on the primary suffering or the circumstance, and we're convinced that's who I am. And if there is this silent watching it might become apparent that's never been who i am that is a movement of thought that is not my doing a movement of thought that is part of the automatic content of life that is always just happening and it can be a revelation because we might have been doing a lot of seeking from that place, thinking that it is seeking that might one day lead to the end of suffering, whereas in fact it is suffering masqueraded, camouflaged as seeking. As soon as the silent part of us that doesn't think, it just registers it just is aware and that silent part of it sees that as thought as an object that's when the game is up that's where the when the suffering energy can't hide out undetected or unseen as what seems like a friend Now, this isn't about bringing that to an end. That might still be there because if the, if the intensity, if the anxiety, for example, is really strong, the thinking might be saying, you can't just sit here. This is dangerous. You have to do something. Um, and that 
loud voice might carry on, which is sort of a, um, a response to the uncomfortableness. And the more it's, it, it's seen, it's just, oh, wow, that is what happens. And I've always felt myself to be that loud voice. That would be a significant um, realization. In order for that to happen, the thinking, the seeking movement, the questioning, the um, really needs to be described as an object. That's one of the ways we become free from identification with that which we are not. So this thinking um, is not what we are. And one of the ways that there is a, a witnessing of it, a silent, effortless witnessing by, not by thinking that is commenting on it, that's not witnessing. Witnessing is, um, is a movement that happens when the object, is, the object that has been identified with as who I am gets seen as just an object. Not by thought, but it. So, in order for that to happen, the the body mind organism needs to be equipped with descriptions that thoughts really are objects that you don't create. Objects that are spat out, just like um, a a boulder rolling down a hill. If you witness the boulder w rolling down a hill, there's no sense that you are doing that. It's very clear that that's just an automatic movement of physics and objects um, moving on their own and not by themselves, as in not them moving themselves, but rather in a way life pushing them life moving them and in this form life could be gravity gravity moving the rock down the the hill so it's very easy to witness that as a happening as not what you are um thoughts the body movement has been um, identified with as what we are for a very long time our whole life. So there has been a merging of a certain set of natural, impersonal happenings and an identification um, with those impersonal happenings. Essentially like confusing yourself with the rock rolling down the hill and saying oh that's me that's i am rolling down the hill and the thinking is i am about to hit a tree um i'm about to fall into the river and that's a thinking about the movement and if the thinking becomes completely identified with the rock then whatever happens to the rock can feel like it's happening to who I am. And so the thinking is not your doing. The thinking happens and then there is a recognition of it. The thinking is in motion before there is any awareness of it. That's what non-doership is pointing at. It's pointing at the fact that you don't do the thinking. You aren't the creator of the suffering feeling. You aren't the creator of the words coming out of the mouth or of the hands scratching or opening the door handle.
and you aren't the one creating the thoughts about what is happening. So if blame about something is happening, something you see on the news, and you get frustrated because there is a reporting about something that you feel is very biased, and then there is thinking about how can this be on the news? That's not you. The news is not you, and the response to the news is not you. You are prior to that or beyond that as a very um, silent and incapable of doing a lot of things. The, the essence of who we are is, mm, is not able to do anything but be aware. And inherent in that there is a sense of existence. Um, but it, it really can't judge, it can't think, it can't discern. Those are all functions of the body-mind organism that is um, inspiring all the thoughts because of a complexity that you have nothing to do with. So in your seeking, stop seeking. And instead, be that which is aware of the experience of life in this moment. Notice that the engagement in the suffering, the interest in it, what is it? Will it will it end? Am I you know doing what's needed in order to bring the end of suffering about? Notice that that subtly might be us saying, it shouldn't be like this. How am I going to change it? It's saying, God, you haven't done a very good job. You haven't in this moment created a masterpiece. I would like to show you how it's done. At least I'd like to tell you what I think it should feel like and look like. Now, that is not the understanding that life is a happening. Now, um, I'll, int I'll, I'll say something here, because the seeking can be broken into um, different movements. And there can be several movements um, that can happen within one day, so they're not necessarily phases that one will go for three months and then the next one will follow and then the next one. There are, these are movements, different movements of seeking um, that can either happen for a phase and then followed by a different movement for another phase, or it can be different movements that interchange and are present sometimes during the day and then later on um, as part of the, the non-doership seeking, the seeking that really has a value of bringing change, a different movement can come in. So what I'm describing here, which is don't, um, and I'm not saying don't to someone, I'm saying what you are is that aware, that is that which is aware of even the thoughts that, that are trying to fix and fix the suffering with seeking concepts. You are that which is aware of that. And that which is aware can't do any thinking. The reason I keep saying that is because that's how we will s start to know it's not what I am. What I am doesn't think. What I am can't think. So when thinking is happening, that might help to um, categorize thinking as not what I am, which means the potential to witness it, to allow it to be there, to see it as thought, um, saying and creating whatever story the thought is about. Um, and this that I am have spent the whole satsang on is one particular movement 
it's not the entire truth. Um, because there will be uh, times when thought is the movement of um, helpful seeking. But if that becomes the only movement, it may be that that um, movement stops being healthy um, investigation and healthy inquiry and turns into attachment to outcome without us knowing it and do a Sherpa reinforcing of that. So there needs to be regularly in our seeking a stopping and allowing the moment to be what it is. So if you find that there is no capacity to stop and witness life as it's unfolding, um, then it's a good indication that that um, movement of seeking, which is one of the very valid movements of seeking, isn't developed. We, we haven't understood that that is a valid movement. There hasn't been a cultivating of that. And so it can be cultivated. What I'm sharing now might be information that allows a different cultivation within the seeking to happen. A cultivation where even suffering is understood to be destiny in that moment. Destiny means what, what is arising is what is destined. What is arising is what is meant to be arising. What is arising is the creation in this moment. And so the attitude of non-doership is the uninvolvement in it, the end of a commentary about what is rising. If we know that the destiny is God's will, destiny is the masterpiece that source is creating in each moment, then no need to get involved in it. Allow the body to be involved in it. Allow the the screaming thoughts to be involved in it, but be that which is seeing all of that as part of the masterpiece. And rest, rest there. And it might not be restful because the uncomfortable might be inspiring what feels like a dragging into involvement in the suffering. But for a little longer than you might ordinarily um, rest, rest there. An instruction that's given in uh, yoga classes sometimes um, where there is an active movement or maybe not yoga, maybe um, exercise or gym work or something like that. Um, the trainer might tell you, you know, do as many of these rep repetitions as you can. So squats, if you're squatting up and down, do as many as you can. They say the ideal would be 40, but you might find that you can't do 40. So do as many as you can. And then just as you feel that you can't do any more, try and do two more or one more. And what you'll find is when you feel like, oh, I can't, you, the, the mind says, I can't do any more. Just do one more and you'll find, oh, I can do that one more or two more. And so this resting, the uncomfortable might be demanding you to get involved in it. And you're about to, you, you're about to give in and say, I have to get involved in this. I can't be the witness anymore. And that's fine. I'm not saying you have to be the witness for an hour. It might be three seconds. Literally, that could be how long. Um, you're about to, and just another second. Or two. If you do that, um, not do it, but 
understand that the information has become part of the um, system and the thought might arise just another second or two of sitting beyond what feels possible. Then there is a cultivating of a habit that is not at all the habit that has been cultivated through the movement of one's whole life. And that cultivating is a, is a, a non-involvement. It is the understanding of non-doership and non-attachment. Why is it non-attachment? It's because it's the part of you that is not involved, not attached to the suffering not being there. It's like um, a witness to an argument going on. Right? There's two people arguing and someone is sitting on the outside witnessing it. Now, you know that it could be that if you're out there witnessing it and then and you hear this argument getting stronger and stronger, some people are drawn in. They just have to go and say, hey, listen, I'm listening to the argument and, you know, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but let me... And they're no longer the witness. They're drawn in. And to the extent that the person can remain just witnessing without being involved, without feeling like they have to interfere. That is non-doership and non-attachment, which means that the sense of attachment, which says I am attached to becoming involved in this, to becoming part of it, that is not happening. So to the extent that there can be a witnessing, in that moment when the witnessing is there, there is the attitude of non-doership and non-attachment. It's silent. It's not um, a thought that says, you can do it, you can not be involved. That's, that's not being not involved. That's holding yourself back um, when there is involvement. The, that's why it might only be that this witnessing can be there for a second or two before we get dragged in. But the movement of being dragged in being invested in the outcomes is so ingrained. Sitting, sitting quietly, witnessing even the body and um, the emotions and the thoughts is not something we're particularly um, habituated towards. Peace of mind is a lot of that um, sense of being unattached, uninvolved, with what the body is doing. It doesn't really mean the body sitting out, not being involved in life. It might start off that building that habit of um, witnessing, which is not what the body is doing, but something that is aware even of the body and the thought, it might start off with the body being uninvolved. But at some point, as it strengthens, it will see the body being involved in circumstance, but there's some part of us that is witnessing all of that as not my doing, not the doing of the witness. And the witness is not something, it's not someone, it's not something that the human does. Witnessing is not... Oh, I, the body, am witnessing the table. Witnessing is a verb. It's what consciousness is. Consciousness is witnessing. It's not something the human being is doing. And that witnessing 
happens when all of these movements of thought of the body movement are seen as happening seen as um, automatic seen as impersonal can we get our head around the fact that the speaking can happen without anybody doing it no one is doing the speaking there is no one there that is a speaker there is a body-mind organism that is programmed, that is equipped to respond in certain situations, and it responds with, with speaking. You sit, this body sits in front of a camera. What does it do? It speaks for two hours. There's no speaker doing the speaking. A uh, nice um, change that happens in the course of seeking is when we find suffering arising, primary suffering arising, blame, for example, which is involvement on one level, uh, involvement, doership, attachment with the actions of the other and an attitudinal blame towards what they are doing in the circumstance, which is either pleasure or pain. So it's an in, uh, attitude, attitudinal involvement um, in what someone is doing. Or let's use a different, just anxiety arising. And at the root of the anxiety, there is an involvement with potential outcome, an attachment to potential outcome. And it arises as an uncomfortableness. And a, a nice movement is where the old experience of suffering, the old experience of anxiety changes such that the anxiety is still there, but there seems to be space um, between the anxiety and the boundaries of the experience so it in practice it feels like i'm there isn't a complete being lost in the anxiety and so you can compare in a way um, especially if you've had the experience of the two the times when the anxiety arises and there's no space all there is is anxiety and in that, the uncomfortableness is very intense. There's sort of no, mm, there's no respite. There's no place in the experience that is free of the um, uncomfortableness. And in the seeking process, we can find that a shift happens where we find the suffering, the anxiety is still arising. And yet there is a, what we would say, a witnessing of the anxiety in a way that isn't you know what i was describing before is when the witnessing isn't very um grounded in our system and so witnessing feels like hard feels like um it's not very natural because the movement is to be dragged back into the involvement in the suffering um, at some point we can find that a very natural witnessing happens, which really is a sign that um, the understanding in the body is, is, is deepening. And so an aspect of the human being automatically, without anyone needing to do it, has separated and is, is the witness of the suffering. And so there's a palpable mm, quality, qualitative difference now,
if that's happening for you, if it's happened for you, you might be very clear that um, I don't know why that happens. Um, it's not really something you do. What it is is that the system has been equipped with um, lots of different information and it might ha have sunk in, for example, that um, a part of the information might have come when we see that, you know, this involvement, continuous um, involvement in the suffering is not actually fixing it, it's making it worse. Um, and it might be a whole lot of other um, insights that culminated in a way that at some point this effortless witnessing of the anxiety happens. Um, and you can't put your finger on what did you do or how did this happen. You just know that the suffering arises with this um, what we call extra space and it qualitatively feels different. Now, to me, that's a different... The, they're two experiences and the witnessing is part of the new experience. So the old experience, as it was created in the moment, is the suffering with just lost in suffering. And what we know as the new experience is the experience of suffering and space around it. It's not... I wouldn't separate, when we look at it this way, I wouldn't separate the witnessing from the experience and the, wit the, the witnessing is witnessing the experience, but rather the witnessing is part of the experience. So then you look at the two qualitative differences, meaning qualitatively one's experience of life is different in the two experiences, and you say that was experience A, history, that's how it used to be, and now experience B is more space. Now experience C can be when... The, the primary suffering just doesn't arise. So then there's no question of witnessing the primary suffering. There is just this third version of life where the circumstance is part of version three, that's part of the experience, which circumstance was part of version one and version two. In version one, there was circumstance and um, the involvement in it, and it all became an experience of suffering. Version two, circumstance, um, the primary suffering, and then some witnessing, or one experience that feels like that. And version two is circumstance and peace of mind. Uh, that's version three, circumstance and peace of mind. And hopefully it's evident that you're not, you don't know what happened for there to be this difference. What happened is that life happened to the body-mind organism and changed it in um, ways that are impossible for us to know. It's like um, waves hitting rocks on an ocean front. And over time, the waves change the rocks. And so if you ask the rock, why are you different? Um, the rock doesn't know what had happened other than you know the continuous movement of of waves but each wave is shaped differently and and so the change is a result of life doing the change so if you can get this qualitative qualitative sense i'm not doing this shift it's just that the experience is now different different that can be important in understanding what non-doership means. So if someone has gone from version A to version B, where there is a witnessing, and then they say, okay, but now how, how is it that the end of suffering is going to happen? Why is it that the suffering is still happening? And I'm grateful for the fact it's not happening in the way that um, it used to, because when it used to, it used to feel... Um, very intense and uncomfortable. Now it still there's the suffering there, but there is some space. But it still feels like my seeking is definitely not over. So what needs to happen next? What do I need to do to get the primary suffering to not arise? You see, that's where 
um, in through some back door, the attitude of doership and attachment to outcome is, what do I need to do? So the reason I pointed out is that to have got to this change, you didn't do anything. Life impacted you. You turned up for satsang and change was happening. And you didn't, um, essentially, you didn't don't know change is happening except when the experience is then different. And then we say, well, how do I do the rest of it without realizing you didn't do the first part of it? Life just lived you um, in a way that it's always living us. And, and so it got you interested in doing this on Monday and doing this on Monday afternoon and doing something different on Tuesday, um, something different Tuesday afternoon where a certain experience happened and um, you know someone didn't turn up when they said they'd turn up. There was suffering and then there was contemplating. Um, and life was making all of that happen. And that's been, that is how your life will continue to be. Um, moment after moment after moment for day after day after day. And that's the change happening. So I couldn't possibly tell you what you have to do. I have no idea. How could I? It's such a unique and complex um, set of uh, chipping away that life does. Um, how can I know what you need to do? How can you know what you need to do? So there isn't an answer to that question. What do I have to do? Um, we might see that that question, what do I have to do to get the rest of it, is that voice that I was saying might be the um, suffering energy taking a form that seems like it's me. Because we're asking a, a, what we think is a very valid question. Okay, so what do I do? That's not you. That's the suffering energy. That's the doership energy. Now, it might not feel very suffering-like. Um, a lot of suffering compared to intense suffering is not very intense, but that mild suffering, even though it doesn't feel really uncomfortable, is very good at covering up a connection to self. And so life might start bringing a movement away from that or a movement where an identification with that type of thinking falls away. And what does that look like, the falling away of identification with that thinking? It's not necessarily the falling away of that thinking, but the falling away of being lost in that thinking as who I am. And witnessing that thinking as, oh, that's the movement of suffering. Not with the aim of changing it. With the aim of admiring it as the masterpiece that is created in this moment. Now, why is that movement into stillness, into quietness? Quietness and stillness because actually that aspect of the human being, that which we could say is what we are, at least in this movement of seeking, isn't capable of making noise, isn't capable of moving. So that's why... I say it's a movement into stillness and quietness. And it's not a movement that the thinking does. It is a movement that happens when the non-quietness and the non-stillness is seen as not what I am. It's seen as a movement, an automatic movement of life arising out of nothing or a result of a very complex, intelligent instrument and in this case the intelligence has gone a bit awry and is intelligence in the form of involvement but nonetheless it's a result of a very complex 
biological and psycho psychological organism. So the thinking is seen, oh, that's not what I am. And a stop. Why is that potentially a good sign if that happens? The reason is what I alluded to right at the beginning of the talk, and that is that what is at the root of the primary suffering is doership and attachment to outcome. And if on the outer layer there is more doership and attachment to outcome in relation to the primary suffering that is arising, and then more doership and attachment to outcome kicks in, that is doing the opposite of undoing the root. What it's doing is it's feeding uh, validation down to that root saying, yes, what I am continuing to know myself as in this moment is doership and attachment to outcome. I know myself in this moment as the one that has to do something about this and has to be um, resistant to suffering, resistant to pain. So if that's the habit that is in play, if that's the attitude in play to the primary suffering, the end of suffering is not in sight. If, however, the attitude to the primary suffering of which the root I have suggested is doership and attachment, if the attitude towards that primary suffering is one of I am, I am the one sitting on the bench, there's metaphorically speaking, when the two people are arguing, I am sitting on the bench disinterested in their argument really sort of I can hear them carrying on but I'm not really interested in being involved so there is a detachment there's a, a, a groundedness in oneself as the witness to the argument um, it's a withdrawal in a sense and a grounding in being not part of the argument. And so that can happen, a, a withdrawal from the suffering, which doesn't mean the suffering ends, it just means the suffering can be there. And the attitude we see is, oh, that is just life. That is a valid component of the current moment experience. That's destiny unfolding. That's God's will for that um, that uncomfortableness to be there. Now what's showing up is the opposite attitude. It is the attitude which is the absence of attachment and doership. Now if the, at the opposite attitude to what is at the root of the primary suffering starts to set in, there is hope for the attitude at the root to start being um, nullified. In a way, you can look at it as an antivirus or a vaccine or whatever. <laughs> Better not say that word. Um, that is going to fight, not support, not really fight in an active way, but it just is withdrawing, feeding the doership and attachment that is at the bottom, that is deep down, because something on the outside is now saying, I'm not that. I am not attachment and doership. I am that which doesn't know how to do attachment and doership. So this root at the base of 
our deeply ingrained uncomfortableness, our deeply ingrained reaction to circumstances that comes up, where did that come from? Um, and why is it that that is not our doing? Um, and it, it may, one, one description is it gets put in place because of an, the attitude towards a particular circumstance when we were young, particularly pain circum painful circumstance. And painful could be different for different people. For um, uh, one person, it might be an uh, extreme um, circumstance of their parents dying in a car accident, for example, and finding themselves at a young age without parents, which is quite a circumstance, quite a painful circumstance. And the attitude might be one of doership and attachment. For someone else, um, their extreme circumstance is relatively not very extreme, but it might be not getting what they want um, when they want it. And the attitude towards not getting what they want when they want it is of doership and attachment to outcome. And to the um, child that had a more extreme circumstance of losing a parent, the way that that was processed might have been with um, doership and attachment to outcome which means an attitude of maybe feeling like they did something wrong and that's why this happened and they were abandoned, um, feeling the pain of not having um, parents there when their friends had parents there and then um, becoming attached to that not being their experience of life, which is all very natural um, very normal movements for a child. So I'm not saying the child shouldn't have done that. Actually, it's completely understandable, but that is what doership and attachment to outcome um, is. And it might be described as that's where it set in. That's where the attitude of doership and attachment set in. I think that we can um, put forward a theory that says it's even before that that the doership and attachment gets set in. Um, and it's precognitive. So a child of four or five could cognize the loss of their parents, not necessarily in the right way, because they might cognize it in a way that, make, that sets in the sense, um, you know, I did something wrong. It's my fault that this happened to the parents, which is cognition, but a bit off the mark. Um, but nonetheless, what I'm pointing out is they have the cognitive capacity. There is a brain that knows how to cognize circumstance. Um, what if the error of doership and attachment got put in place even prior to that experience happening and that that interpretation of the experience was a, essentially a continuation of a prior embedded doership and attachment to outcome? Um, to give you the example, what if that gets put in place as part of the birthing process? That human birth can be processed, interpreted on a precognitive level by the, inf by the baby as being separated from source. So the, the, you are ejected out of your home that you are essentially one with very comfortable in there and feel like that's who you are in union with the mother. And at some point, this sort of strange shaking and twisting and whatever happens and you get thrown out and then the cords cut. And what if that is processed by the infant in a precognitive sense, so a much more primordial interpretation, not cognitive as we know it, what if it is um, processed as having done something wrong and therefore having been thrown out because of having done something wrong? Um, now, if that is the case, we can clearly see that's a misinterpretation. The mother has not um, got that attitude towards the child. It's a very natural movement of of evolution and growth of a baby is to be to be birthed. Um, so what if the infant in a precognitive stage um, locks this attitude in place? Now that clearly means it's not the doing of 
uh, entity that has control over what they conclude, but rather an automatic conclusion, an impersonal conclusion. Um, so you would say, well, I guess that's what happens in this life because the systems are more or less, um, there's a commonality to the structure of the baby and a commonality in the, in the circumstance. And maybe this is the, the standard interpretation on a precognitive basis. And what if that error, that mistake, which essentially becomes a mistake of who we are, like I am the one that is not good enough, I am the one that has failed, I am the one that has been separated from my source. What if that wasn't even the beginning and that that was a continuation of an earlier ingraining of non-doership and attachment. So the, in the situation where the baby is being birthed, there is an attachment to remaining in the womb um, and maybe there is the sense I as this has have done must have done something wrong for this to have happened. And if it happened before that even, and that was a continuation of an earlier ingrained principle, what if it is part of the movement of consciousness going from its potential state um, of the unmanifest, and at some point the unmanifest potential has to actualize into manifest reality or manifest actuality. And what if in that movement there is a sense of having been ejected out of source that I, you know, there was absolutely no problem when the unmanifest was there and maybe the, this movement from the unmanifest to the manifest embeds the primary error, the primary false sense of who I am, the one, what have I done wrong to be thrown out of God and I'm not talking even here about I the baby, this is a movement on the level of creation fundamental just what happens when the unmanifest not even aware of itself so no uncomfortable not whatsoever becomes manifest um that may feel like i'd like the other back please um and so the birthing error might just be a continuation of a misinterpretation because um, going from the unmanifest to the manifest wasn't a personal throwing out. It wasn't because anyone did anything wrong. That's just the nature. So the reason in saying that, that's a theory. It's a concept. It's not a concept I'm just making up. Um, there were certain insights and experiences that happened along the way that sort of s revealed this is a potential theory. Now, just because there's an experience um, which include you know a lot of energy in it and a lot of um, doership that got released doesn't mean that that experience was telling me the truth. Um, I don't relate to it as being absolutely I would put my life on the block um, and say that is the truth of how the universe and the belief in personal doership and attachment unfolds. However, what it revealed is a potentiality, a potential um, explanation that demonstrates the fundamental error that is not an error that anyone is doing, but rather an error that is part and parcel of this creation. And that might help us understand that the very deep, deep root at the base of suffering is a sense of shame a sense of not being good enough, a sense of not being worthy, a sense of being unlovable, all of which may have been put in place as part of this abandonment movement, this rejection movement. And that, if that's the original sin, sin in Latin means error, if that was the original error, then everything that comes after it has to follow that original error until the error is corrected. And that might explain why there is this uncomfortableness that we feel. And if we feel it, um, we might find that 
as we go deep down enough into it, with the aid of maybe an explanation that allows this to be felt, there can be a sense of lack of self-worth, a sense of um, needing love from the other. Why would we need love from the other? Because if there's a sense that I'm not lovable, that I've done something wrong, the craving might be for um, input from outside that says that's no longer the case. And if someone loves us, we ah, oh, what a relief. Now, it'll only be a temporary relief because that um, deeply ingrained false sense of self is not going to be fixed by love from the other. It just feels like that's what it's craving. And so when it gets it, there can be a temporary reprieve. And then after a while, because it is so primal, it'll then pervade into that circumstance where the love is being delivered and there'll still be a sense that something is missing and we might then go seeking more love or new circumstance that will fix it not realizing that the solution is not in finding love that will confirm that this feeling is not correct but rather the solution is this feeling extracting itself if the feeling extracted itself and we go, oh, something's strange, something's different. We might not know what it is. Um, we probably would if the whole feeling extracted itself out. There would be a significant qual qualitative change. But um, if it was extracted out, we might find that a movement for validation is no longer supported. And if you get validation, it's like, oh, thank you, that was nice. Um, but not if you not received as it was when there was a craving for it. When there's a craving for it, there's a sense, I need this in order to be complete. I need this validation. And so we're out seeking it. Our whole life can be a life of seeking love from the other, seeking being understood, seeking being accepted, seeking being... Um, felt to be worthy and whenever the other delivers something the op to, the, to the opposite extent that confirms that the other thinks we are not worthy then we go that's not what I want from you all I want is for you to understand me to appreciate me to tell me I'm good enough and you give me the opposite and it intensifies the problem well, it doesn't really intensify the problem what it does is it triggers um a confirmation of what we actually believe about ourselves deep down. So this explanation might help shed light or put a spotlight on the movements that have become so habitual that we might think are harmless. When we look at them, we see I'm actually seeking and validating by seeking love we're actually saying, I do think I'm un unlovable and I'm hoping I'll find some proof otherwise. But in seeking the love, we're actually confirming I don't think I'm lovable. When, If that were to dissolve, we say, oh, I know myself differently, we'll find that these habits of pandering to the other or um, being afraid to do certain things because um, what if I'm rejected or said, told I'm wrong, um, those movements might not be inspired anymore. So we find that that deeply ingrained root is, is forcing, is commanding a certain way of being in life. And so if that dissolved, we realize, I don't, love from the other was never the solution. The solution was the dissolving of the deeply ingrained belief of personal doership and attachment to outcome. The personal doership is, I am the one that didn't perform up to standard and therefore I was thrown out. I was unloved. And so I am the one that is responsible for my unworthiness. And what I am attached to is appreciation and love. Because I believe if I have appreciation and love, then this uncomfortableness will go away. So 
why is it helpful if the um, non-doership with the suffering, if it arises, if the suffering arises in the form of a sense of mm, unworthiness or uncomfortable with this with oneself, anxiety, um, if that arises, why is it an interesting sign if it's allowed to be left as it is? It's because the very attitude that was put in place as the primal misunderstanding, doership and attachment to outcome, I need things to be different. And I'm the one that um, forced this to be the way it is and I'm the one that needs to fix it. That's what's at the root. And if we find that the suffering is allowed to be, the opposite attitude is setting in. Now, if the opposite attitude sets in here, it may penetrate down and undo the opposite attitude that is leading to the suffering. And that might well be how that deeply ingrained error dissolves. And then what we find is my way of living and my experience of life changes. So we think the solution is doing and controlling life. So let's see where that is infiltrating in as the, perpet as the perpetuation of a deeply ingrained belief of self. I am the doer and I am attached to outcome. And once it's seen as perpetuating and validating and reoccurring in your life, there may be a motivation to witness. And in witnessing, there may be a lack of energy um, maintaining that movement. There may even be, as, as energy is withdrawn out of it, a different biological movement or psychological movement um, that starts happening, that is a change of that habit, simply because the energy is being pulled out of it. There might be a capacity to say, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do what I want, not what the other wants. I've never done that. And with that energy withdrawing, it might be possible to say, no, instead of yes, which is the habit that has been saying yes all the time. So um, on that note, we'll see if there's any questions. However, the, the thing is the questions are usually going to come from a point of view of, you know, what can you say something about this? which is a different movement, still valid um, movement of seeking. But it's in a way g um, going to be uh, a different topic to what we're talking about today. So if the questions come through and they are, uh, sort of say are questions that demand a response from that I would normally give breaking down things in detail, which can sound like, okay, you have to do this, I'm probably going to answer it in a way that doesn't really give you a a causal answer. So um, ask the question with that in mind. Hello, Nino. There. It is so nice to be here and I hear a little feedback, but now it's gone. Um, thank you so much for um, all of your talks. It's just so lovely and wonderful. So thank You're you. Um, You're thank my you. question is about um, predetermination. And I know that word is kind of fuzzy, um, but nonetheless, um, so is, so I, I'm trying to understand if, predetermination is supposed to be like I kind of buy into the idea like it kind of makes sense you know and the way you articulate you know the big bang and how you know we're basically debris and you know it's good the pattern is going to go on as it was always going to go on and it's more like a time is more like a box rather than a linear mm -hmm. or 
uh, sequence of events and so on. Um, but is the is that idea is the purpose of that idea supposed to be a is it is the only is its only person to dismantle the belief in doership and so that you can eliminate feelings of shame and guilt, et cetera, because aren't there, could there hypothetically be other ways to get rid of those feelings? Like, do you necessarily have to subscribe to predetermination in order to get rid of those feelings? Um, Like, is this a necessary part of the path? And similarly, you don't talk that much about, um, interdependence um actually forget that part but I I just sometimes I wonder if like these are ideas like like the idea of surrender and predetermination which are kind of related like are they supposed to be just you know psycho-spiritual tricks that are help that help you dismantle the ego and belief in doership or are they actually like or or are they like real (laughs) and so or like is it or are they like i don't know is that maybe the difference is not important maybe it's not important to like know if it's real or not as long as it gets the job are you saying is that the is that the truth is it really all predetermined (laughs) um (laughs) isn't that right well i guess the question is like is the is the purpose simply of these ideas to be tools or are they, do they go beyond their tool effect? Yeah. As you were saying, yeah. Yeah, so um, the concepts are all concepts. Um, so even if I'm talking about the concept of gravity, um, it is a description of something, not the thing itself. Um, now, in the case of gravity, the concept of gravity is talking about something that um, we could say, at least on one level, exists as a phenomena um, or phenomenon. Um, it is a phenomenon in life. Um, and so we can have a concept of gravity that is not just made up to achieve a purpose, um, but it actually is a description of a phenomenon. Um, in the teachings, whatever is spoken about is obviously always the concept. Um, like the, whatever is said in a physics class about gravity is the concept of gravity. But the concept of gravity is given so hopefully the student can understand gravity beyond the concept and see gravity in action. Um, understand that when the leaf falls off the tree... It is dragged to the ground by this invisible force that um, we have a conceptual understanding of. But then when we see it in action, we, especially if we can then measure certain things as well as just seeing it, we can start to have a more experiential um, and direct understanding of what is pointed at in the concept. Now, in some concepts in spiritual teachings, they are just... um, tricky or not tricky but helpful um notions that uh are not that close to what actually is um i would say that predetermination is a concept that primarily it's there to bring bring about the end of suffering um because that's what we're really looking for that's what seeking is about. That's what the Holy Grail that is available in the concept I put forward is that peace of mind, the end of suffering, is enlightenment. And when that sets in, when we find ourselves living life, inevitably at some point going to die, but living life without an uncomfortableness, without suffering, we will have the first-hand experiential realization, recognition, this is the best I can hope for in life. 
um, as a lowest con common denominator, as a continuous unbroken um, uh, background, let's say, of life, is peace of mind. Um, there's an experiential self-confirmation from the fact that it is free of suffering, which means free of wanting something more and um, feeling like things aren't right. All of that is, would be suffering and it's not there. So we say, wow, what, what an interesting thing. Not at all what I would have imagined. But now that it's set in, I can see, I can know, yes, this is a fantastic solution to life. Um, a fantastic solution in the face of the inevitability of circumstance being out of my control. Um, so really it's about suffering and the end of suffering. Do I look at the notion of non-doership and the notion of predetermination as f falling, um, uh, falling short of being sustainable and argued as um, valid concepts describing actuality? And the answer is no. I don't feel um, having, um, let's say, a perspective of life um, not, uh, not of just seeking for the end of suffering, but where, where being, being clear for myself on what is teaching, what are teaching concepts, what they're trying to achieve and all of that, do I say that the notion of predetermination doesn't hold water after suffering has fallen away? And I would say, no, I can't say it doesn't hold water as an explanation of actuality. What I would say is it isn't an absolute explanation of actuality. Non-doership and predetermination um, can be argued against, um, and I would agree with the arguing against it, but it doesn't, the arguing against it doesn't nullify it. It puts some caveats around what the attitude of seeing or what seeing life as predetermined means and what it doesn't mean. And one of the examples of that is seeing life as predetermined doesn't mean um, we there should be no effort in life. It doesn't mean there should be no sense that a circumstance that we are in in this moment can change. Um, it doesn't mean that I I'm not going to be instrumental, sort of I as the actions of the body. Um, it doesn't mean that the body is not going to be instrumental in the change happening. So um, I hope you get what I'm saying is that someone might hear the notion of predetermination and have their idea of what predetermination means. And it might be, oh, in that case, if everything's predetermined, what's the point? Um, and if that expression came out from someone, it would be a sign for me that they are interpreting what predetermination means in a way different to how I see predetermination. And so um, if someone said, look, I just simply don't agree that predetermination is a valid concept, it's probably because they are interpret interpreting my notion of predetermination as more absolute than I am holding it. And um, also interpreting predetermination as being the, ex the exclusion of certain things that may not be things that I exclude while holding the notion of predetermination. Um, so I'm very confident to say the attitude of predetermination is a, a very healthy attitude to have as long as it is a, a well-refined version that doesn't eliminate our ability to function a certain way just because we believe in predetermination. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Mm, you're welcome.
hello, Walter. Oh, hello. How are you, Roger? Yes, I'm excellent. Thank you, Walter. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Thank you for asking. Great. Uh, my question was to do with the uh, <clears throat> detachment from outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been thinking about that. And, um, you know, I have no problem with any of the concepts, understanding them as far as non-doership. But I wonder if maybe you'd give me an example of what that would look like not to be attached to outcome. Because mm -hmm. I was, just for example, like, I know you're into gardening. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine when you go out there, there's some expectation of, you know, what the results of your labor will be. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little disappointment if things don't turn out, you know, the way you had planned or things don't grow. I just, mm -hmm. I just think in daily life, I, I'm observing not extreme attachments, not suffering, but I mean, everything I do, there's a certain expectation that there'll be a, an outcome, mm -hmm. uh, a desirable outcome. Sure. And yeah. it may be, perhaps it's the biological versus the um, psychological suffering, like you've explained with anger and things like that. But I just wonder if you could, yeah, on that. it's very good. And you've introduced you. uh, um, a setting being gardening that I will use as the example. Mm. So um, about six months ago, uh, maybe a bit more, eight months ago, I transplanted a, um, a big tree from one part of the garden that is sort of out of sight into uh, a more central position where it, it I was hoping it would become a feature. Um, and so it took about four or five hours to dig the tree up um, and it was heavy and I had to move it downhill and it was tiring um, and I had to take soil that it was growing in to add that soil into, because this particular tree has a, a certain relationship with microbes in the soil it's growing in. And anyway, so there was a whole process and it's a lot of effort and so obviously there was a hope that I was doing it for a reason. I thought I had considered this. I said, I'd like this tree to be in this position of the garden, which it's not in at the moment, and so I'm going to move it. So there, there was a, a, an objective there. Um, otherwise, you know, why would we do anything? In the same way, if you make an investment, clearly you can say, well, I'm doing this with the hope that the investment is going to appreciate in value. Um, and all of that is part of the biological um, level, unless it um, is infiltrated by what we call attachment. So then the obvious question is, okay, well, if I have, if you have the, if Roger has the hope that the investment is going to appreciate in value, that the tree is going to like its new position and survive, and then act as a, a nice feature in the garden. How is that different from attachment? And the answer is a easy one, and it I'm glad you brought it up because hopefully it allows us to see that there is a biological preference. I have a preference for this tree to survive because I think it's going to look good in this situation. However, my attitude is I know the outcome is not in my control. What happens is essentially destiny unfolding. Um, and it's, it was, it's bound to happen the way it happens, including the idea I had to move this tree, um, the functioning. And now whether the tree survives or not is up to all of the factors that I've had a part in. Um, and yet now whether the, the roots take hold or whatever, is, it's clearly not in my in my control. So I do have a preference for it to survive, but I know that the outcome is not in my control. So when I really register the outcome is not in my control, in a sense, I've already opened up to the fact that the future can be anything, um, which really means no attachment to the outcome, 
because I understand that now I've done my best, the outcome is not in my control. When attachment to outcome does exist for um, a human being, which essentially essenti uh, attachment to outcomes is my sense of self, my identity, who I believe myself to be, is invested in outcomes. Or so basically, is my sense of self is intertwined with outcomes, which means I feel like not only do I have a preference for this tree to survive, but if there's attachment to outcome, I have a preference for it to survive, and my sense of self is in part affected by and dependent on whether it survives. So with attachment to outcome, we almost exclude the realistic outlook that circumstance can deliver any outcome. And we essentially say, it's not going to deliver any outcome, it's going to deliver what I want. Um, because we need it to deliver what we want according to our sense of self. And so that means that we go forward not understanding that the outcome is not in my control, but essentially feeling like the outcome has to be one way and I'm going to do my darndest in each moment to ensure that that happens. Um, and when it doesn't happen, not only is our biological preference um, not delivered, but as a result of our biological preference not being delivered, because our attitude of self is intertwined in that, we experience the pain of the biological preference not being delivered and the uncomfortableness that says this was an attack on who I am. This outcome is actually now diminishing me instead of adding to me. If the tree had survived, I would have been happy. And the experience is I'm not happy because this tree hasn't survived. Um, and so the important thing is to see this distinction between the biological level, the circumstance, and in the circumstance there is a preference, um, and whether the preference is delivered or not is going to mean pleasure or pain. Obviously pain if it's not delivered, pleasure if it's, if it's delivered. So tree surviving pleasure, tree dying pain. Um, the attitude to the tree dying is a, a different um, component of the experience. And if the attachment isn't there, when the tree dies, we say, well, you know, pain in the moment, but hey, I am, I exist. And instead of losing ourself, essentially, losing contact with the part of us that still very much is, even though the tree has survived, instead of remaining um, connected to that, if the attachment is there, we lose ourselves in an uncomfortable psychological story that is attached to that outcome for however long that is until it wears away and then some semblance of peace comes back in when there is a realization, not necessarily a conscious realization, but the circumstance sort of becomes old and the attachment falls away and then we find ourselves, I guess, no longer in that uncomfortableness. But that can go on for years um, probably not because a tree dies, but because, you know, someone you trust mm, betrays your trust. That can be something that you feel uncomfortable about for years and years and years. Thank you very much, Roger. Mm. Pleasure. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mm, pleasure. Uh, okay, we uh, we've gone over time. I'll I'll try not to extend it beyond the two hours. I um, appreciate people um, have other things to do. So thank you for joining me, and peace for now. <laughs>